Um, as many of you know, when I was seven years old, my parents, my dad was in the Air Force. Um, so we lived four years in England, four years in Belgium, and then three years in Germany. Uh, when we lived in Belgium, I started going to a Baptist missionary church. And in this Baptist missionary church, like many kids that go to church, especially children that have to sit in the main service, I really didn't pay too much attention to what was said throughout the sermon. But at the end of the sermon, the pastor said, if you die today, do you know if you would go to heaven? And I thought to myself, I don't know. You know, I don't know for sure. So I went to the front. They took me in the back and walked me through the scriptures. And I accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior. Um, but that next week, I was on a bus ministry, so my parents weren't with me. I went to the church. And again, they asked the same question at the end of the sermon. And even though they had took me through the scriptures and I had made a confession of faith, um, I still didn't know for sure. So seven years old, I ran to the front of the room again and did the same thing. And it, it must have happened several times over and over again because I really didn't know. Well, if you look at the church today, and many Christians, maybe they've been in the church for 10, 15 years, even though they know the gospel, even though they accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior, many of them don't really have something that's called assurance. How do I know that I'm truly born again? In fact, Jesus said this in Matthew 7, 21. Matthew 7, 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Um, one of the things that you'll see if you study doctrine, if you study, it's called historical theology. If you study historical theology, you look at how the church has perceived certain doctrines throughout history. One of the things you'll find is that many times doctrines are lost during centuries. For instance, in the Middle Ages, we know that the doctrine of justification by faith alone was lost by specifically the Roman Catholic Church at that time. People were selling their property so that they could go to heaven. They were um, paying for their sins to be forgiven. And this doctrine was lost during this period of time. Well, one of the things, if you looked at this, this time frame of ours, one of the doctrines that's kind of been lost is the doctrine of assurance. How do I know that I am saved? Each of us, many of you guys have been raised in church and you've been trained. You can lead people to the four spiritual laws, how to accept Christ. You can take them through the Roman road. Um, how, to get, how to get saved. But many of you, if somebody asked you to tell them, how do I know if I'm saved, you wouldn't know how to do that. Because part of the reason that many Christians are kind of deficient on this is this is an area that's kind of been lost in this period of church history. It hasn't been taught. And for that reason, one of the things we're doing is that we're heaping up many people in the church that probably aren't really saved. They know the theology. They know the language. They would, in fact, call Christ Lord, Lord. They may even serve in the church, as this one says in Matthew 7, but they're not really born again. So therefore, this is a theology that is very important to us, the doctrine of assurance. How do I know that I am saved? In fact, if we went to Revelation chapter 3, the church of Laodicea, in Matthew 3, 15 through 20, many of you are familiar with this, Christ is speaking through this, to this church through the Apostle John. He says, um, you're neither hot nor cold, you're lukewarm, and I will spew you out of my mouth. He says these things about the church. In verse, six, verse 17, he says, you say I am rich, I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing, but you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline, so be earnest and repent. Verse 20, here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with them and he with me. The reason I share that verse with you is because many people look at that verse and believe it's actually a picture of a church where there's not one person that is saved. A whole church that comes on Sundays and worship, worships, but there's not a redeemed believer in the whole church. Where do we see this? He says, you're, he says, you think that you're rich, but you're really poor. 
Ephesians 1, 3 says we have every spiritual blessing in, every, in spiritual places. If you were born again, you are very rich. He says, you need to buy from me white clothes, white robes. One of the things we know that represents is forgiveness of sins. They become white. But he says, you need white robes. He says that you are blind. You need to have eyes that you can see. But believers are ones who've had their eyes open. He says to them, I stand at the door and knock. Let me in. But believers are one who Christ indwells. So just as we see in this passage that maybe here is a church that is, there's not a redeemed believer in the whole church, that we're heaping up many believers in our churches around the world that aren't truly saved. And they don't even know how to test the reality of their salvation. I used to use this illustration when I was a youth pastor in Chicago. Let's, let's say me and Alexi, Alexi just got a car. We, we were both carless not too long ago. Alexi got a car. In fact, I'm not going to use Alexi. You're boring. No, just kidding. I'm going to use Busby. I like messing with Busby. Me and Busby like to go to McDonald's. So let's say me and Busby go to McDonald's, but we have chapel service. And so we show up here, and we're 15 minutes late. And I get up here on the pulpit, and I say, guys, I apologize. I was with Busby. That's why I was late. And while I was with Busby, we got hit by a Mack truck in his car. And so that's why we're late. And you guys would look outside, and let's say Busby's car is parked right out there, the black one. And you look at it and say, well, there's nothing wrong with Busby's car. A back truck is a really, really big truck. You look at Busby, he's still got the sharp haircut. There's no cuts upon him. There's nothing on. You look at me, there's nothing wrong with my clothes. There's no, uh, no, uh, nothing from a burn or something from, on my clothes. You say, Greg, I just don't think you got hit by a Mack truck because there's nothing wrong with the car. There's nothing wrong with Busby. I know he's like Superman, but dang. And there's nothing wrong with you. It's impossible that you got hit by a Mack truck. That is a weak illustration, but it's kind of very similar to what people are saying in the church today. I have a relationship with God. I've encountered God in my spiritual life, but I haven't been changed. My language is the same. I do the same things. I watch the same shows. My, my life hasn't been transformed. Let me tell you something. Just as me and Busby can't get hit by a Mack truck and come in here and look the same, you cannot get hit by something as big as God and look the same. But that is what is going on in churches all around the world today. God is my Lord, but my language is no different. I still sleep with my girlfriend. I still do all these different things. There's nothing different about me. But I know God. That is what is happening in our churches today. And part of the reason that is happening is because this doctrine of assurance has been lost in the church today. So what we're going to be looking at is the book of 1 John. John actually, the, the major premise of this book is assurance. How do I know if I am truly born again? This is what, let me read the verse to you again. 1 John 5.13. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. John says, I want you to be sure about this. This is the most important thing in each one of our spiritual lives. Isn't it something that we should be sure about? Isn't it something that when people ask you if you know you're going to heaven, you should be able to say, yes, I have assurance, I know John says, you need to know this. And that's why I wrote this whole book, so that you could be assured of your eternal salvation. So what we're going to do is going to be kind of unique, unique for a sermon. One, in this, we're going to look at 13 tests, 13 tests that John gives in this book. And as we go through these tests, what I want you to do is you're going to be checking off your own spiritual life. Has this happened in my life? Has God changed me in this way? so that I can know if I am born again. This is probably the most important test you'll take this year, probably the most important test you'll take ever in your life, okay? This is, and I, I wanna add this in here because Paul kinda says the same thing. 2 Corinthians 13, 5, 2 Corinthians 13, 5 says this, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you unless, of course, you fail the test? So this, 
afternoon, we're going to be taking a test, 13 questions, where you can test the validity of your spiritual life. Am I truly born again? Better to find out now than to find out in the last days and say, Lord, Lord. Amen? Here's the first question. Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? We see this in 1 John 4, 14. And I should warn Alexi back there. We're going to be rapid fire, verse by verse by verse, because there's 13 points. So lots of verses. 1 John 4, 14. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in him and he and God. Now this is called the doctrinal test. And this is very important because there are many cults out there, many sects and factions of Christianity that deny the deity of the Son of God. And so same thing that was happening in this church, there are false teachers denying the deity of Christ, him being the Son of God. And he says, look, if you don't believe this, you're off on the whole ball of wax. If you don't believe Jesus is the Son of God, then you are not born again. That's the first test, the doctrinal test. And I think that the majority of us would believe that. Here's the second one. Do you have genuine fellowship with the Son and with God? Do you have genuine fellowship with the Son and with God? 1 John 1, 3 says this. 1 John 1, 3. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. I'm going to read you another verse, 1 Corinthians 1.9. 1 Corinthians 1.9. God ha who has called you into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, is faithful. This is important because many people, Christianity is a culture. It's something that they were raised in. They've been in church since they were a kid because their parents were in church. And they have a religion, but they have no relationship with the Son of God. In a relationship, you're growing, you're knowing the person more. And this says, God has called you into a relationship with the Son. In fact, when we read Matthew 7, 23, what does Christ say to these people that said, Lord, Lord, I never knew you. They had the doctrinal test, right? Lord, Lord, they knew who Jesus was, but they never had a relationship with the Son of God. Do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Does he speak to you in the morning? Does he speak to you at night? Are you drawing near him and having a relationship day by day? Or are you just part of a culture that says, I am a Christian. Do you have a relationship with the Son of God? Here's the third one, and this one's really important. Are you extremely sensitive to your sin? Are you extremely sensitive to your sin? 1 John 1, 6 says this. 1 John 1, 6. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in darkness... We, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his son purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all righteousness. Now, the first part of this verse says, if we claim to have a relationship with God and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. If God has saved your life, he has changed your relationship to sin. Your relationship to sin isn't the same way it used to be before you were born again. Let me give you an example. When I was, when I was in college, I played basketball at Texas A&M Commerce. And one of my friends was a very good football player. And uh, we went to church together. We go to small group together. And as I was getting to know this guy, he had shared with me that he had had sexual relations 
with 64 women. He was keeping count of them all. And so as we continued to have, be, have fellowship, I challenged him. I said, look, dog, I'm not judging you, but John says, you're not saved. John says, if you, if you walk in darkness, if you have this continual relationship with darkness and say that you have a relationship with Christ, you're a liar. And so I challenged him about his faith, and he made a recommitment, a new commitment to Christ, one that changed his life. But there's another thing in this passage. He says, if we claim that we have no sin, we lie and the truth is not in us. See, that's something that's very common when you're trying to witness to an unbeliever. Sometimes they say, well, hold up. I'm not a sinner. I'm a good person. Oh, there's nothing wrong with me. If, God, if, if you have been born again, God has changed your relationship to sin. You can't live in it the way that you used to live in it before. You, you don't think that you're perfect, and then you see here in this passage that, he, that you're always confessing your sin before God. Has God given you an extreme sensitivity to your sin, or can you live in it? Can you pump it through your music? Can you watch it on the TV? And it doesn't affect you in any way. Has God made you extremely sensitive to your sin? Here's test number four. Do you practice a lifestyle of obedience to the word of God? Do you practice a lifestyle of obedience to the word of God? This is what 1 John 2.3 says. 1 John 2.3. My wife likes to throw away my plastic bottles, so I had to take hers today. I'm like, I'm the only one that drinks out of plastic bottles. You know I'm going to use it for my sermon. Just kidding, babe. No, I'm not. 1 John 2.3. We know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. The man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in him. The word obey is actually a really interesting word. It can actually be translated keep. It can be translated guard. The picture of it is like a, 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 a centurion or a soldier who protects a treasure. This says something about your relationship to the word of God. Has God made the word like a treasure to you? You enjoy it, you study it, you read it, you desire to live it out in your life, you keep them. God has if God has not changed your relationship to his word, then you are probably not born again. Those who are born again hunger and thirst for righteousness. And God has given you a hunger for the word of God that never was there before. The world looks at you and says, why are you in small group throughout the weekend? Why are you in church on Wednesday? And why are you in Alpha and Sunday church? Why do you want to be around the word of God so much? You read the Bible every day. What's wrong with you when the world has no desire for his word? Has God changed your relationship to the word of God? Here's the fifth test. Are you rejecting a love for this world. Are you rejecting a love for this world? This is what 1 John 2.15 says. 1 John 2.15. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. John says, one of the ways you'll be able to discern if you are truly born again is that God has changed your relationship to the world system. Now, what does this mean? It means many things. Uh, it means many things. But here's, here's a practical illustration. Matthew 19, we see a rich man come up to Christ. And he says, how do I get eternal life? Right? And in our churches, me and you, we've been trained in the four spiritual laws. We know the Romans road. We know all these different ways to lead them to Christ. We would have sat them down and led them to Christ. But what does Jesus do? He looks at this man and says, you can't be saved because you already have a God. Your God is money. And he says, if you're going to follow me, you must give away all your money and, and sell all you have and come and follow me. See, this man, his money, was, his money was his God. His love was his money. We see the same thing in Matthew chapter 6. Jesus says, you can only have one master. You cannot, uh, you cannot uh, serve money and serve God. Now, for many people, 
money, especially in the church, many people, money is really their God. Money says what school you go to. Money says what job that you, what career you choose. Money is a ruling. It tells us what to do with our lives. Instead of, God, what do you want me to do with my life? God, what career would you have me to do? How would you have me to serve your kingdom? See, many people in the church, like this rich man, money is actually the God ruling in your life. And Jesus said, you're either going to love one or hate the other. Do you still love this world? John says, your relationship with this world should be changed. What's the next test? Number six, do you hope for Christ's return? Do you hope for Christ's return? This is what 1 John 3, 2 says. 1 John 3, 2. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. John says that every believer has this hope, starts to live a holy life. Do you hope for Christ's return? Let me give you a support text. Philippians 3.20. Philippians 3.20. This is what Paul says. But our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. The word eagerly in this passage has to do with a fixed look. So much so, you can't even see what's going on over there. You are totally fixed on this coming return of Christ. Let me tell you something. The world isn't looking for the coming return of Christ. And Christians who love this world aren't looking for a coming return of Christ either. Because they love this world. They don't want to leave it. They don't want Christ to come and change up their plans and their dreams. They're not looking for a coming Savior. They don't desire that. But those that do, it changes their life. Do you hope for the second coming? In fact, Jesus says you, could, you should pray this every day. Lord, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Christians who aren't really born again can't even pray that with their own heart because they really don't want a coming kingdom. They really don't want a savior to come and change their plans, their dreams. So they don't pray that prayer. They only pray, Lord, give me this. Lord, help me get a good grade. God, help me this. But they forget the first thing that Christ has called them to pray. Lord, come, bring your kingdom on this earth. Do you have a hope for the coming kingdom? What's the next, next question we have? Number seven, is there a decreasing pattern of sin in your life? Is there a decreasing pattern of sin in your life? We see this in 1 John 3, verse 6. 1 John 3, 6, it says this. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Number 9, verse 9 actually says this. No one is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in him. He cannot go on sinning because he has been born of God. Now, if we look at this verse, it may seem to say that if you get saved, you're going to be perfect. That's not what this verse is saying. In fact, in 1 John 1, 1.8, we just read, he says, he who says he's without sin is a liar. So what this is talking about is if you have been born again, you should see a continual pattern of sin decreasing in your life. You can't live it anymore. You can't love it the way you used to because God has changed your life. You can't continue because God has put his seed inside your life. Has God, again, changed your relationship to sin? Do you see a decreasing pattern in your life? Question number eight. Do you love Christians? Do you love Christians? This is what we see in 1 John 3, 14. 1 John 3, 14 says this. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers. Anyone that does not love remains in death. Now, I often meet Christians that will be like, oh, I, I, you know, Jesus is my savior, I love him, but I don't feel like I have to go to church. So I just stay at home and I listen to my, my radio and I listen to sermons and stuff like that, and I don't feel like I really need to be part of the church. Now, I often struggle with this 
Because if you're really a believer, it's not like you come to church just to hear the sermon. You come to church because you love the people there. You love the people. You desire them. You care for them. You want to meet with them. You meet with them day by day because you love the saints. If you have been born again, God has changed your relationship with believers. Where before you thought, man, those people that are at church all the time, they're strange. I don't understand them. Why are they reading their Bibles and praying? You thought they were kind of weird. Now you love them. Romans 5.5 5 says this. The love of God has been shed abroad in your hearts by the Holy Spirit. God gives you a supernatural ability to love other believers. Now, we see this throughout the scriptures. You go to Acts chapter 2. You see the people that just got saved after Peter had preached. And what they do, the rich believers sell all they have to give to the poor in the church. And all of a sudden, the poor, they have everything in common. Why would they do this? Because in a moment's time, something supernatural had happened in their heart. To all of a sudden, people that they did not love before, now they love them as family. Jesus says this, who is my brother? Who is my mother? But those who do the will of God, they become your family. And all of a sudden, where you'd only sell your house and sell your car to help out your family members that are sick, you're doing stuff to help people in the church that have different colors, different races. Why? Because there's a supernatural love inside your heart. Has God given you a love for the believers? Do you love Christians? Jesus says this in John 13. John 13, verse 34. John 13, 34 says this. I give you this new command, and he goes on and says, they will know that you are my disciples by the way that you love one another. He says, not only will you know that you're saved, 1 John, but Christ says, everybody else will look at you and say, this person must be a believer. Look at how he cares for them. Look at how he meets with them every day. Look at how he sacrifices for other believers. The world will look at you and say, man, there's something really strange because of this supernatural love for other believers. The world will recognize it, not just you. Has God changed your relationship with believers? What's the next question, the way that we test our salvation? Number nine, are you experiencing answered prayer as a pattern of life. Are you experiencing answered prayer as a pattern of your life? We see this in 1 John 3, 22. 1 John 3, 22. And we, and we receive from him anything we ask because we obey his commands and do what pleases him. Let me tell you something. When you are born again, you enter into the family of God. That means that God is your father. Jesus says this in John chapter 7. He says, if you ask for bread, would your father give you a stone? He says, if you ask for a fish, would your father give you a snake? He says, God is your heavenly father. He desires to answer your prayers. In fact, my father was zealous to make sure I had all my clothes, zealous to meet my needs. And if you're part of the kingdom of God, you have a father that answers your prayer as well. Has God answered your prayer when you needed grace to speak to your friend? You said, God, I want to win my, win my friend to Christ. I'm scared to talk to him. Have you found that at times when you're speaking to people that God gives you words to say? All of a sudden, supernaturally, you have things, ways to answer their questions. Have you found that in times when you were weak and you were praying that God lifted you up and built you up and gave you strength? This is normal for someone who has a father in heaven who cares for them and wants to give them bread and wants to give them fish and to meet their needs. We receive answers to our prayers because we have a father that loves us. Does that mean that he gives us everything we want? No, because our natural father didn't do that as well. But he answers our prayers as a pattern of life. We have a father in heaven. What else do we see? Here, here's a, a strong one for you. Number 10. Are you experiencing the work of the Holy Spirit. Are you experiencing the work of the Holy Spirit? Look, look what John says in 1 John 4, 13. 1 John 4, 13 says this. We know that we live in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. John says this should be, should be something in your life that should be radically different. 
you can tell there's a supernatural power working your life that you should be able to look at yourself and test. Do I have the Holy Spirit? In fact, in Acts 19, verse 2, we see Paul meet these disciples. And he goes up to them and says, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Paul would look at them and say, you should be, if, if you're a believer, there should be something different about you. Acts 1.8, Jesus says, that um, when he ascended, that you would receive power from the Holy Spirit in your life. Paul, so much so that Paul looked at these believers and says, I don't see any power in your spiritual life. I, I don't see anything different. You know, have you received the Holy Spirit when you believe? John says that's one of the ways that we'll know that we know him. Now, what does this mean? What does this mean that we receive the Holy Spirit? I'll give you a couple of things. Here's the first one. We're experiencing Christ's lordship in our life. Experiencing Christ's lordship. We see this, 1 Corinthians 12, 3. 1 Corinthians 12, 3. Therefore I tell you that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus, be cursed. Listen to this. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Now that seems kind of weird, right? Because anybody can say, Jesus is Lord, how is that proof that the Spirit of God is speaking? Well, this is what, this is what uh, Paul meant by that. He wasn't saying that you believe that Jesus was God. He was saying that God, Jesus was your Lord, that you are willing to give up everything to follow him, that he's the one that's the guiding principle in your life because the Holy Spirit has enabled you to do that. James chapter 2 says, even the demons believe he's God. It's not about just an intellectual knowledge, but you are experiencing God guiding your spiritual life. He is your Lord. God, what do you want from my life? How do you want me to live? How do you want me to respond to this person? What should be my response to this person that's hurt me? God is your Lord. That is a work of the Holy Spirit. It's normal for a person to say, God, you're my Lord, and I want to live, for, live my own life, do my own things. That's natural. We live. We're our Lord. But he says that the Holy Spirit is the one who enables us to make God our Lord. Here's the second way that we can see it. Do we have the Holy Spirit? Has he enabled you to understand Scripture? Has he enabled you to understand Scripture? Look at 1 John 2, 27. 1 John 2, 27. John says this. As for you, the anointing you receive from him remains in you. And you do not need anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and as that anointing is real, not counterfeit, just as it taught you, remain in him. So John says that if you've been born again, that there's an anointing on your life. What's an anointing? Well, if we look at the Old Testament, we see that when God was going to call a king, when he's going to call a priest or a prophet, he would have somebody come and pour oil on their head to anoint them. And what would happen right after that supernatural, it says the Spirit of God came upon them. And all of a sudden, Saul, who was afraid, became strong. He became willing to be a leader. There was an empowerment to prophesy for the prophet. There was an empowerment to rule as the king. Well, God has empowered you in a special way. What's that way? To understand the word of God. Now, an unbeliever looks at the scripture and says, man, I don't understand this. This doesn't apply to my life. I don't understand why people read this dumb book. But if you have been born again, God has supernaturally anointed you where this Bible is life to you. This Bible speaks to you. You desire it. You desire to hear it. And you understand what it's saying because there's an anointing on your life. The Holy Spirit has anointed you to understand the Word of God. What's another test of the Holy Spirit in our life? This is what Romans chapter 8, verse 15 says. Romans 8, 15 says this. Here, actually, I'll give you what it is. The Holy Spirit gives you intimacy with God. The Holy Spirit gives you intimacy with God. Romans 8.15. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by him, him being the spirit, we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies to our spirit that we are God's children. One of the things that the Holy Spirit is meant to do in your life is he is increasing your intimacy with God. The word Abba means daddy dearest. Dad, I love you. Daddy, father, I love you. You're, I'm intimate with you. 
is the Holy Spirit increasing your intimacy with God. By him, we cry, Abba, my father. When you have a need at school, you say, Father. When you have things going on in your life, you say, Dad, I need you. You say, when things are going difficult, you say, oh, God, I need you. The Holy Spirit works in you because he's, ca he's calling you to an intimate relationship with him. Is he your Abba? Is he your daddy dearest? The Holy Spirit gives us intimacy. Has God given you an intimate relationship with him? Number 11, three more tests, three more tests. Are you discerning spiritual truth from error? Are you discerning spiritual truth from error? This is what 1 John 2.19 says. 1 John 2.19. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. Verse 20. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and all of you know the truth. I do not write you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie comes from the truth. Essentially, in this context, not only is the anointing enabling these Christians in the church to, not, um, to discern God's voice, but to discern what's not of God. If, you have, if you're a believer, you have a built-in lie detector. A built-in lie detector. You may not know much scripture. You may not know a whole lot about God, but you got people that are false prophets teaching you, oh, maybe there's no hell or maybe this in your life. And all of a sudden you say, well, I don't know a whole lot about scripture, but I know that's not right. I don't know what it, I know what that guy, I don't know very much. I'm a new believer, but I know there's something wrong with what that guy's saying. And you have an anointing that enables you to discern truth from error. That's one of the things that, Paul, that John is talking about. Let me give you a, a support text. This is what John 10, 4 says. John 10, 4. This is what Christ says about him being a shepherd and us being a sheep. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Therefore, Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, I am the gate of the sheep. All who ever came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. If you went down to verse 27, he goes, my sheep listen to my voice, I know them, and they follow me. Jesus was essentially saying, all those before me were robbers and thieves. He was talking about the Pharisees, the Sadducees that were teaching false doctrine, and he says, the people that were mine, they would not listen to them. They know the voice of the shepherd, and they follow me. They will not. They run from anything that's not of me. They would not listen to these thieves and robbers. See, that is true of you if you have been born again. When people are running out and they're following the cults and the false teachers and they never return back to God, then the problem is probably that they never were sheep. They never had the lie detector that kept them from believing the false teaching and the false doctrines that came into their life. Only the sheep can hear the Father's voice, and they can tell that this is not of God. This is not God's will for my life. This is not what the scripture teaches. The sheep will not follow the voice of another. Are you discerning spiritual truth from error? Two more tests. Here's another test. Are you continuing in the faith? Are you continuing in the faith. 1 John 2.19, we just read it. 1 John 2.19. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. What John, what John is saying here is when the false teachers and the false prophets and those that were following the cults out of the church, he says this proved that, that, were, that they were never of us. Now, this is a very important point. This is the reason. There are a lot of people in the church that are teaching such doctrines as if you have a moment of faith, if you have a warm, fuzzy feeling in a church service and you say, God, you're my Lord, you can fall away from God, you can turn from him, you can turn your back, never follow him again, but you're going to heaven because you had a moment of faith. That is not true. 
If you have genuine saving faith, that faith continues to follow God. That faith continues to pursue him. They went out from us because they were never of us. Let me give you another support text for that. We see this in Matthew 24, 10. Matthew 24, 10 says this. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. Now, this is a passage where Christ is talking about the end times. One of the things we know about the end times we see in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, it says the end, that the Antichrist will not come until there's a falling away apostasy. In the end times, there will be slews of people that are falling away from the church. There will be many false prophets, many false teachers, and Christ says that those who remain will be saved. Even though there's persecution, even though people are dying for Jesus, the ones that keep following him even unto death, they're the ones that are truly saved. He says, those who remain shall be saved. If you read it, and it just, you may say, well, remaining makes you saved. No, no, no. It's saying it's a proof of the fact that you are saved. Are you continuing in the faith? There are, in fact, one of the things we see, maybe not so much at Handong, but when you look at the church today, I even think this apostasy is getting close. We look at statistics. They say 70% of youth that are Christian, that go to college, fall away and never return back. We are seeing a great falling away from the faith even now in our day. Our college students, you go to many churches throughout the world, and you'll find lots of old people, lots of people that are over 30 or 40, but your generation, 20-somethings, 25-somethings, they're missing because 70% of them are falling away. Let me tell you something. One of the proofs that if you're born again is that your faith continues. It's not a momentary, oh, I love you, God. Or, and then you go run away and you never seek him again. It's a genuine faith that continues even in the midst of persecution. When you get to the workplace and you're going to, you can get fired for talking about your faith. You can get fired because you're a Christian and you, you're tempted. You continue even in the midst of persecution. It's a genuine faith because God has given it to you and it's genuine. Are you continuing in the faith? That is a test of salvation. Here's the last test, and some people have called this the golden test. This is the genuine one. This is one that we should all, I mean, this is the, the gold stamp on a believer's life. Here, here it is. Are you experiencing suffering for your faith? Are you experiencing suffering for your faith? This is what John says. 1 John 3.12. 1 John 3.12. Do not be like Cain who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do, my, do not be surprised, my brothers, if the world hates you. Don't be surprised that just like Abel being a good believer, a good person, he didn't do anything wrong, but his brother killed him. Don't be surprised if you go through persecution. Let me give you some further support that this will happen to every believer. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 5, verse 10. Matthew chapter 5, verse 10. It says this. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He says those who suffer for their faith, those who are ostracized, people don't want to hang with them, they think they're weird or strange because they don't sleep with their girlfriends and not getting drunk on the weekends, people start to think you're strange, then that is probably, it's, he says, theirs. This means theirs alone. The word is emphatic, theirs. Theirs alone is the kingdom of heaven. Are you receiving any ostracism, any separation, any mocking for your faith? Let me, let me give you another test that maybe this will bring it really close to home, especially in a college environment. This is what 1 Peter 4.3 says. 1 Peter 4.3 says this. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, detestable idolatry. They think it's strange that you do not plunge with them in the same flood of dissipation, and they heap abuse on you. This is what Peter says. This will be normal. 
that people will think you're strange because you're not going on the weekend to get wasted, to go, to, to go mess your brains up. They'll think you're strange because you're, I had a, a Christian tell me how his friends were like, his Christian friends were like, what type of pornography do you like? You know, like types of pornography. What, what type of pornography do you watch? Here, he's, and he's like, what do you mean? They're Christian guys. They'll think you're strange if you're not doing the stuff that they're doing, living in lust. They'll find you strange if you're not getting drunk on the weekends. How about you? Do people think you're strange or do they think you're just like them? Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness, for theirs, theirs alone, is what it really means, is the kingdom of heaven. Do you suffer for your faith? Remember, this is what Paul says. He says, examine yourself. See, one of the problems with our church today is nobody wants to evaluate themselves. Nobody wants to test the reality. They just want to be comfortable. Let me tell you, comfort comes when you have assurance. John wrote this for you in the, in, in the seats that say, man, I struggle. I'm not sure. God wants you to know. And one of the ways you know is that he who is in Christ is a new creation. All things are passed away. All things become new. There should be some changes in your life. It doesn't mean you're not going to stumble. It doesn't mean that you're not going to fail. The test should assure you when you do stumble and fail. When you do blow it, when you do make a mistake, these tests assure you that the overall bend of your life is, I desire to keep and guard his commandments. His word is precious to me. God has changed my relationship to believers. I love believers. I love them. That's why I meet with them. That's why I go to small group, because I love the people of God. These verses, 1 John 5, 13, is meant to comfort you when you do stumble and you mess it up because God wants his children to know that they're his. It would be weird for a father not to want you to know. These are tests for you to assure yourself. But let me give you this. These tests are also here because Jesus says there will be many. There will be many in the last days who say, Lord, Lord. They served in the church. They prophesied. They cast out demons, but he says, I never had a relationship with you. This, this here is meant to comfort some and shake others, to challenge them about the validity and the reality of, am I truly following God? Is this just my culture? Is this just what I was born into? I was born in the faith? No, you weren't. Is this, is this, is this, is this my genuine lifestyle? I've chosen to follow God for the rest of my life. What about you? When you tested the, when you took the test, Peter, uh, Paul says, examine yourself. Are you in the faith? What did you come up with? What does this say to your heart? Every head bowed, every eye closed. We're going to spend some time in prayer responding to this.